Drew Devolt manages a relatively small source forge, at least relative to the size of GitHub and GitLab, by the name of SourceHut. It's by no means a major player in this space, but it certainly has its advocates. And for the past year, it and a bunch of other small source forges have been experiencing a very peculiar problem. As Drew would put it, effectively Google has been DDoSing their services. Now, DDoSing is obviously extreme hyperbole. What he actually means is a disproportionate amount of traffic has been coming from the Google IP space. And they did have a plan to address this, but the solution they went with is basically just a band-aid. At this point, Google represents hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of different projects. So more specifically, it was the Go project and its module proxy and module mirror. What basically happened is of the past 100,000 HTTP requests made to SourceHut and every 100,000 period before that for the past year, 5% of those requests came from the Go module proxy. Now that might not really sound like that much. Oh, 5% of requests are requesting your website or doing something of that nature. That's not what's happening. Those 5% of requests, every single one of them, was a full Git clone. So for small repos, that's not really that big of a deal. But when this was hitting things that were multiple hundreds of megabytes, and then doing that multiple times a minute, that can be pretty taxing. So what happened a year ago? Well, Go 1.16 was released, and with that update, came a change to the way that package caching was being handled. So this issue started a few days earlier to that problem, but that's likely due to the fact they were doing some early testing, and then it really ramped up when 1.16 actually came out. Drew initially made an issue about this problem on February 21st, 2021, but back then he didn't really know what the problem was. He realized it was coming from the Google IP space because that's really easy to find. And by doing a bit of digging, he realized it came from something involved in the Go project. But the problem is when Go was making these requests, it didn't have a useful user agent string. So he couldn't really determine exactly what was happening. So initially all he wanted was useful information being provided so him as a server administrator could actually do something about this, find out what the problem is, and then work with the Go team to try to actually get this addressed. There were some concerns about adding in the user agent string because when you have a user agent string, then you can go and distinguish the traffic between other traffic and maybe return different information, which I know some sites do. Like, I think there's one site where if you're using Brave, it will literally just not function with the default user agent string. Ultimately, what they decided, though, is they would include the user agent string, but not include the version of Go, because that information just didn't really seem to be that useful, and seemed to be a slight privacy violation, even if it's not that big of one. Then, as of five days later, the user agent string was changed to be something very clear, and from Drew's side, he verified that, yeah, this change had actually been made, thank you for doing that. But two days prior to that, Drew started to discuss what the problem could potentially be. But one of the maintainers basically said, hey, can you just go and file a separate issue about that to make it so it's really clear to see what's going on? He went and made that issue, proxy.golang.org, unusual traffic to Git hosting service from Go. This was made on February 24th, but because the update hadn't been made yet, not much could really have been done. So pretty much they were having a small back and forth for a couple of days, and then on February 26th, Drew posted this right here. With the new user agent in place, I can characterize the behavior more concretely now. Over the past hour, I've received 1,912 requests from proxy.golang.org, from IP blocks 74.125.0.0 slash 16, and 173.194.0.0 slash 16. The full list of requests is available right here. I'll show you that in just a moment. With columns for the request IP, date, and hash of the module URL. Redundant requests per IP address are somewhat reasonable, but redundant requests across all IPs are less so. There is some room for improvement here. So this is the full list of requests. So let's take a hash of some random module URL. Let's say this one right here. The first one will do a search for that. And let's see where it actually appears. So it appears on 
this IP address here, three requests from this IP address. Let's see if we have something on a separate one. This one from another separate IP address. This one on another separate IP address. And as you can see, there's like a minute or even a second between some of these. So they're hitting the exact same thing, trying to get more updates to it when basically no time has passed. And if we keep going down, there seems to be requests happening in 15 or so minute blocks, which if your goal is to be refreshing your mirrors, seems a little bit excessive to me. But if that doesn't make it clear enough, this second and third one absolutely do. So the second one breaks it down by how many times each IP address hit each module. And then this third one is how many times each module was hit. And this first one was hit 140 times, the second one 57, 44, 44, 44, so on and so forth. And keep in mind, this happened within the span of like two hours for a mirror. Something that really helps to understand is how Go's module system actually functions. By which I mean, I have no idea why they decided to make it like this. So Go basically makes use of a direct module system. Most module systems pull from a repo where you go and upload something to that repo and then people download from the repo. Go doesn't do that. Go instead gets you to download directly from the developer's Git. Now, that puts a lot of stress on those source forges. So instead of doing that, what they do is also give you the option of having this mirror. This is the Go proxy. And this mirror needs to be updated every so often to make sure that what's in the mirror is actually up to date. So this update process, the Go developers refer to as a refresh job. And clearly by what we could see, the refresh job was running way too often, and you had nodes repeating the exact same work as other nodes, you had nodes repeating the same work they literally just did, and it was putting a lot of stress on places like SourceHut. So to address this, the Go developers supposedly made a change. Hi Drew DeVault, I wanted to give you an update that we've gone ahead and improved our refresh jobs to hopefully lead to less duplication of request traffic to origin servers. This could yield a two to three times drop in requests. Now, two to three times is always something I love to hear because what it means is we didn't actually test this. We don't actually know how much it's going to do. And it turns out that what it did was um, I can confirm the load is reduced, but it is still a bit heavy, all things considered. Actually, I want to quantify my impression of a reduced load and found that it has not changed much at all. It has gotten worse in some respects. Fresh data in the past hour received about 2,500 requests from the Go module mirror user agent. The new breakdowns of IP by module are here. So it seems like whatever change they made didn't do anything. With some of his following comments, though, he did jump the gun a little bit and thought that 2,000 requests per minute were being made from Google. It turns out that wasn't actually the case. He did apologize for making that comment and said, hey, uh, it turns out that someone else actually sent a bunch of traffic. The ghost stuff was at the end of the logs, and I sort of just assumed that it was the cause. That was my bad. I can't read, apparently. At this point, the solution that Drew saw was most practical was respecting something known as the robots.txt file. This is basically a file that you include on your website to tell crawlers what they can do on your site, how much traffic they can give you, and things like that. And because the Go module proxy was effectively acting like a crawler, it sort of made sense to have it be controlled by this file. This is a standard way to handle stuff, not something he made up by himself. But Drew wasn't the only one with a problem here, and another developer by the name of Ben Lubar started noticing a lot of traffic coming to his server, and he didn't really have that much traffic beforehand, he was basically just managing it for himself. Four gigabytes of data came in for a single module that was requested 500 times. And this wasn't a module that other people were using. He was just hosting it on a remote, so he had a copy of it somewhere saved if, you know, his computer crashed or something like that. Clearly at this point, it wasn't just a source hut problem. Other users were being affected as well. If this is the traffic that is going to the really small source forges, I don't want to know how much extra traffic places like GitHub and GitLab are receiving. It would have to be probably 
terabytes or maybe even petabytes of data. Then the maintainer that's been commenting a lot basically said, hey, thank you for the feedback. We're still working on this and appreciate the extra details. And Drew, like Drew has to do sometimes, leaves a bit of a snarky comment. Please reprioritize this. If any organization with more accountability than Google was DDoSing hosting providers since February, then it'd be front page news and their ISP would have cut them off. He's not wrong, but probably not the best way to word it. Following that, Katie said, hey, we are taking this seriously. We are trying to deal with this. We've been working on this really hard for a while. And a solution was proposed. Currently, a single request for a module may cause refetch traffic for several days after. That may be what you're experiencing. One idea we've been discussing is to make it such that our job only make refresh requests if the module is deemed popular enough e.g. the module has been requested a hundred times in the past week. However, this is going to require some re-architecting and database changes, so it is taking some time to work through. Keep in mind, this was posted in June 9th, 2021. But in the meantime, there is a temporary solution. If you would prefer, we can turn off all refresh traffic for your domain while we continue to improve this on our end. That would mean that only the traffic that you would receive from us would be the result of a request directly from a user. This may impact the freshness of your domain's data which users receive from our servers since we need to do some caching on our end to prevent too many frequent fetches. We can do the same thing for Ben Lubar's domain if preferred. Basically, it's meaning we can blacklist your domain so refreshes will not happen there anymore. We'll maintain some form of mirror, but it won't be refreshed like every 15 minutes. And then pretty much people can still use Source Hut to host a Go module. It just will take a little bit longer to download. So for the bigger packages, it might not be as practical. Now, Drew was very focused on getting this properly addressed so that he, as the system administrator, actually has control over how much traffic is coming into his server. He was very focused on the robots.txt file so he could actually control what the crawler was doing. They didn't really care too much for the crawler at this point, but Ben had his own solution. So he was very happy to have them add him to the exclusion list, but temporarily what he was doing is when that module proxy was hitting a server, he would start returning an HTTP 429. That is the standard code you return when something is hitting you with too many requests. And obviously that made the amount of data being downloaded massively, massively drop. But what I don't know is if they were actually respecting the 429 or if they were still hitting a server, and because it was returning 429 rather than a positive code, it just wasn't able to download the data. From then on, this issue basically sat dormant from June 17th, 2021, all the way up to about five days ago in 2022, so roughly May 26 or so. Keep in mind, the problem wasn't fixed. The only reason the discussion happened again is because Drew posted this blog post explaining what has been happening. And this guy, Anacron, basically said, hey, what's the go here? Is this problem going to get fixed? Source Hut is still experiencing the exact same problem. And Hezchi, one of the maintainers, had this to say. Anyone who's receiving too much traffic from proxy.golang.org can request they be excluded from the refresh traffic, as we did for Ben Lubar's server. Nobody asked for Source Hut to be added to the exclusion set, so as far as it's concerned, nothing has changed. We did consider caching clones, but it has security implications and adds complexity, so we decided not to. It is certainly not trivial to do and not do something we are likely to do based on the issue. I have no idea what that says. Since there hasn't been any activity on this issue in nearly a year, I'm closing it. Anyone who wants to be excluded from refresh traffic can file a new issue. A year ago, this exclusion list was a temporary solution while they work on something more permanent. Now the exclusion list, which is not a good solution, it, that you have to go and open an issue or send them an email every time you start a server and want it to be excluded, is now the permanent solution. Someone let Hezchi know that this was posted over on Hacker News, so this is why people were suddenly commenting, and he did have something to say about the robots.txt solution. The proxy performs a mix of user-initiated traffic for which robots.txt is not applicable, and refresh traffic, which might perhaps be. 
for boring technical reasons, keep in mind this is a GitHub, the place where boring technical reasons are sort of expected, it would be a fair bit of work for us to read robots.txt, so rather than going through a bunch of work to do that, we implemented a trivial list and offered to add SourceHut to it. That offer was ignored at the time, but is still open. I want to say there's probably standard ways to read robots.txt in basically every language involved in the web, but sure, I'll take your word for it. One thing that seems really strange is since June of 2021, Drew hadn't commented on this thread whatsoever, which seems really strange considering how active he was in the thread, how much he wanted to actually get this fixed, and the fact that Drew likes to talk about himself everywhere that anybody mentions him. Knowing Drew, he's probably going to be in the comment section of this video. If he's not, I'll be very surprised. Anyway, according to him, I don't have any evidence of this. The Go maintainers have said nothing about this either. He says that he was banned from the issue tracker on GitHub, and he says it was for mysterious reasons. I don't have any evidence that he was actually banned, but I'll just take his word for it. Honestly, I have no idea how the FOSS world holds itself together. It seems like every other week there is some random little squabble about some random thing, either app images or Go or this or that. Something is always going on. And what it reminds me of is the fact the FOSS world is just a bunch of individuals making software. This isn't a big corporation doing anything where there's like some overseer that's managing everything. This is just people that happen to all want to do the same thing, so it kind of makes sense why people occasionally fight about it. But let me know, do you think the Go team and Google should actually address this problem, or is it fine to just leave it as it is and work with the exclusion list? I would love to know. And if you know anything about whether Drew was actually banned and what reason it might actually be for, please let me know about that in the comment section down below as well. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. If you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe to the Pay link in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech of a Tea. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robson Plays. That's going to be it for me and I'm out. <laughs>